how do you escape enemy mode? What is enemy mode? When your brain and your body are just against somebody, what if one brain state could help explain why we stop listening to people, why we stop talking with people, why we stop caring about people? And what can be done about it? Today, we're talking with clinical psychologist and neurotheologian Jim Wilder uh, to talk about how do we identify and overcome enemy mode. As always, this is Jeff Holsklaw. We'll be joined with uh, Sid Holsklaw also. This is the Embodied Faith Podcast, where we're trying to help people get unstuck in their spiritual lives through a science-informed spiritual formation. As always, we are brought to you by Grassroots Christianity. Welcome, Jim, to the show. We're so glad that you're here. Just I forgot to do the whole kind of uh, introduction, but you are the author of many books, uh, Renovated, God, Dallas Willard, and the, chur the Church That Transforms, as well as the other half of the church. Um, you um, work, you're kind of like this founding member and leader of the Life Model Works uh, group, and you just recently authored and released the book, Escaping enemy mode, how our brains unite and divide us, which is what we're talking about today so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Jeff and Sid. Well, so your work as you know, this is now the third time you've been on the show, which I think is the record. So you're leading the pack here on <laughs> invitations. But as we've said in previous shows, you know, Sid and I became familiar with your work through uh, people in Chicago, you know, one time Sid came back from this uh, training and she was like, hey, you know, like there's this thing in our brains like they, they call it uh, like the relational circuits. And when it's on, like we can communicate better. And when it's not on, then bad things happen. And I was like being the intellectual that I am. I was like, oh, so there's like a brain state that I can cultivate or learn about that helps me relate to my wife better. I should probably learn about that more and that was you know probably 15 years ago that started us on this journey um but now and it, i'll just say it radically changed the way i parented to learn that it was yeah. just, it was that's that's originally what brought me to that training was okay parenting is bringing out all sorts of ugly in me mm -hmm. <laughs> i got to do something to figure out how to deal with this because i don't want to raise my kids this way yeah that's really uh clear to us when we we're doing it in a way we regret, but right. how is it supposed to work? No, exactly. No one really gave us the manual on that. So, yeah. Well, and so you've been a part, uh, you know, we had uh, Chris Kersey on um, a, a bit ago to talk about the joy switch and cultivating joy, which is how you get into this kind of positive kind of mind state of having your relational circuits on. But now you've kind of taken this other topic, which is what you're calling enemy mode, which is almost the reverse. It's not just that your relational circuits are off. It's maybe something even more malevolent. So uh, could you could you just kind of explain where did this idea come from outside of, you know, Jesus saying, love your enemies and pray for them or something like that? How does how did this book get written? How did you uh, and your co-author get started on this? Well, uh, what Jesus had to say about loving your enemies certainly was a very strong influence, and we can get back to that. But uh, the, you know, basically about the time that uh, this ha uh, really came into focus for me was when the whole COVID uh, vaccinations and red states versus blue states and the police violence, all those things were happening, and I'm looking at people getting into fights about everything. They can't go home for uh, Thanksgiving or Christmas or, or holidays because they're gonna be a conflict with the rest of the family. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was even walking through the grocery store, the story we used at the beginning of the book and uh, two older ladies are, you know, banging carts into each other, uh, you know, and yelling about masks. I thought, hey, wow, there's something going on here. And for about 20 years, I've said that, um, you know, we really have to solve the problem of how the brain go about, goes about hating people because hate underlies almost every nasty thing that, uh, that happens. So uh, why is it that suddenly people who, um, you know, otherwise claim to be Christians uh, are, you know, acting hostile and, uh, in, and they don't see what they're doing? 
in fact, they justify it. So I thought, yeah, we got to understand this better. And I wasn't reading any place that was explaining it. So uh, that was the, the motivation from, from just life. And I think most of us have lived through that alienation. I think the, uh, most of the churches in our area lost large numbers of uh, members, either because they wanted masks or because they didn't want masks. You know, and if that's enough to break up the church, what's the mechanism behind it? How does that work? Yeah, for sure. Um, that yeah, happened at our church. <laughs> yeah, and it and I I'm glad that that you're naming that. It was to, it was a very mystifying kind of surreal experience to see so much, um, so much of that like protection and attack and so much of that happening amongst people who out of one side of their mouth are saying we're following Jesus and out of the other side of their mouth are saying I'm against you. Mm -hmm. um, so I just really, I resonate with, with that. And I so appreciate that that led you to say, what is going on in the brain that has made this so much the, the, the sign of our times? It's just, it, it affected everyone. Yeah. Uh, devastating for most, families still to this day there's still yeah you know that undercurrent right there even if we kind of got back to being nice to each other but it's like but don't bring that up because you know uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so or me is going to go off yeah it's so true well and the thing that i really noticed about the book and that you kind of mentioned is that it's it's not written like just for christians it's rather written for a broader audience and you really kind of bring in what I really appreciate is you're, you're bringing in conversations of certainly neuroscience, but also corporate culture and workplace kind of scenarios. You're bringing uh, a lot of conversations about the military uh, and how kind of higher levels and how people are trained in the military. So it just brings in all these kind of like aspects of our lives um, to kind of show how is it, how is it that these things are all kind of working? I think that's so important. It's so needed. Uh, it's so helpful to kind of look at all these different uh, layers because you started with this, um, like this question, rather than starting with the answer, right? Even yeah, we didn't we didn't know how the brain did it, uh, but there was one thing that's really clear from the literature, and that is that hate is not based on opinions mm. or beliefs. And if I listen to culture everywhere I'm going around, it's like, well, you believe this, so you hate. You believe that, so you hate, and it's all these. Uh, this close tie between hate and belief and the brain simply doesn't work that way. And that was already pretty clear in the literature. So I said, you know, we have to really figure out uh, how these things do interact. Cause it's also obvious that, uh, you know, hateful beliefs interact with something, but mm. uh, you know, how does that go together? And, is our Christian beliefs the cause for Christians being so hateful? Because hmm. that's how we're being portrayed in the right. in the media, and uh, you know the the science says no, they're not. It's not our beliefs that make us that way. But then what does? Yeah. Uh, and no one could say what what was actually happening. And so we we sort of set out to solve the problem, and we proposed to a publisher, you know, can we write a book about trying to solve this problem? At the end of the book it may conclude, uh, you know, here's how it works, or it might conclude, uh, you know, we, we can't figure it out, but somebody <laughs> needs to do this, and, and here's what we've done so far. Yeah. Uh, so it was a very interesting adventure to set off with, uh, and then to co-author it with a retired army general uh, who spent his whole life, uh, you know, fighting enemies, and yeah. I'm sort of, uh, I come from a pacifist tradition in the Christian church, uh, and, and, you know, uh, social sciences. And it's like, well, I, I'm not so much in favor of uh, fighting people. So, uh, and, and how does that fit together with beliefs yeah. too? It, it made a real interesting mix while we're, <laughs> while we're trying to write a book. How, how did the two of you even come to a place where you wanted to figure this out together? Oh, well, it was rather funny because uh, we were thrown together. Um, I, Right at the time that I was deciding I have to figure this out, uh, our board of directors announced that they had just hired a new uh, CEO for uh, our organization, Life Model Works, who was a retired general. And so my my boss suddenly 
is, um, you know, this military man. Uh, and uh, we're an organization who's trying to figure out how to teach the world to, to love your enemies. You know, Christians are statistically about one out of five people in the world. So if you get every Christian to love four people, you know, we'd cover the globe. Wow. Uh, and he's like, uh, I'm not sure that's going to work. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, it, we said, well, you know, we have to solve this together. That's what, you know, what you were hired for. And that's what I'm here for. And so, uh, there we go. yeah, it's, it's a very un unlikely relationship that started up. Yeah. What a great way to begin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's uh, jump into what is enemy mode. Uh, and then uh, you talk about three specific kind of expressions of that but could you give us kind of your baseline uh definition of what enemy mode is yeah it's some kind of a predetermination in your brain that the person on the other side isn't is against you they're not on your side hmm. and so we react very very quickly to other people you know by perceiving that they're not going to be on our side with little something sets us off. And from that point on, you know, our interest in listening, our interest in attuning to, and our listening to, you know, wanting to be close to them kind of disappears, goes out of the window. It's like, you know, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I like you or I want to be around you. Uh, and often the case is the person actually uh, would like to explain something to us. They would, they would like to, uh, you know, share some thoughts with us, but our brain is going, I'm not listening to you. Mm -hmm. Inside me, I feel like, you know, I'm just waiting for you to stop talking so I can say what I'm going to say, you know. Mm. And I know my brain is not listening to you. It doesn't, you know, I, I don't want to know what you have to say because I already know you're, you're not on my side. So that makes me think of, um, so in my coaching work, I often, you know, talk with clients about helping to understand what's happening in their bodies. And the way that I have ex explained it is just, you know, talking about the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. and how we can either prioritize connection or protection, but that it's nearly impossible to do both at the same time. So does that kind of fit with what you're talking about with the enemy mode? Is that, that is that flip from connections no longer matter to me. I'm only prioritizing protection. Definitely the case that it, all the modes, uh, that the ways that the brain does enemy mode uh, involve shutting off the connection, uh, relational connection with the other person. We've just got several ways of doing it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, all three ways of staying disconnected with you is I'm, I'm not going to share life with you now. You're, you're not on my side. So... Um, well, and that's part of it's protection. Part of it is wanting to win. Hmm. So there's, yeah. a, there's another motive in there. Well, let's go with the first one then. You have, and this is super helpful, is that there's like three different expressions of enemy mode. You know, when I first picked up the book and I was heard about this project, I was like, oh, this is so exciting. And I was like, oh, there's three levels. Yeah, so that was the fascinating. First one? This is so uh, the simple enemy mode. Uh, what, is, what is that and what's happening in the brain, Jim? Uh, yeah, the simple enemy mode is the most common, and that's when my my brain just sees you as going to be a problem coming my way right from the beginning. Uh, so <laughs> that one of the, the classic examples is that, uh, you know, my basement is where I do my writing, and there's a stairway right over there, and my wife would come down the stairway. She wanted to talk to me about something, and my brain would go, Oh, she's here to interrupt my work. I'm very busy writing about relationships and their importance. And she's, <laughs> she's going to wreck my work, you know, so she's not on my side. That sounds kind of familiar. There's someone in my house who used to respond that way. Well, yeah. I'm not downstairs. I'm only down the hall. <laughs> down the hall yes. Even closer. Yeah. So, but, I do you know, it too. So I'm not just saying Jeff. I do yeah. it too. Yeah. So here's this, you know, very funny thing. I, I I already know she's not going to be on my side before she's do, done anything at all. And, uh, you know, there's some people like I can go to the clerk on the gas station or something like that. I never, it never occurs to me that they're human. So I, I treat them with some indifference, but it's not enemy mode. It's just I not being relational right now. I'm just trying to get my credit card to work. But this case, there's the anticipation that this is going to be bad. And mm. so how does, how do I 
uh, shut down my desire to be relation, relational with her. So to, to jump a little bit ahead, uh, I remember when I was in uh, college and we were dating, I used to drive halfway across the state of Minnesota, in, in 40 below, to see her. And, uh, you know, I would say say to myself when she came down the stairways, you know, this is the same person I would drive halfway across Minnesota <laughs> and 40 below to see. So I think there's something about her I must like. Now that she's coming down into my basement, this should be a good thing. But let me see if I can remember why I like her. And I'd have to get my relational circuits on, and then I'd be interested to hear what she had to say. And so I had to overcome my negative predictive bias that comes from the and so level of the brain. How do you catch yourself in the act of, of doing that? Because that's something that I'm always, you know, working with clients about too, is that how do I, how do I have that moment of pause where I'm able to observe, I'm starting to look at this person as an enemy. How do I make that switch to actually being able to observe that and make a different choice? So how did you get to that place where you could move from she's a danger and a threat to this is the woman I drove across the state to see. Um, well, there was really uh, several ways of doing it. One was to notice that I wasn't present in my body. Uh, so my body tenses up instead of having a smile on it. Um, and so, uh, uh, but a second way that I would do it is I began the practice of trying to share my face with Jesus. Uh, so if I could be present in my body and I could share my face with Jesus, then every time I saw somebody, I would want to let my face reflect what Jesus was feeling. And I could sense, you know, because my I could start to tense up. Okay, she's here. She's she's going to wreck my sentence that I'm working on. Um, and I go, I'm feeling tense, uh, but I'm supposed to share my face with Jesus. I don't feel like it. Where is he? Where is she? Where, why am I not? Why am I not present in this moment? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the second thing is I gave her permission to tell me when it seemed like I might be in enemy mode. Okay. So uh, it, it takes just a few loops through that and your brain starts anticipating, oh, you know, hey, you're headed in, you're in or headed into enemy mode. And mm -hmm. so by a little practice, now the first few times we practiced, it went badly, <laughs> but that's how practice goes, right? Right. So, uh, so those are some of the things. I don't know if that answered your question exactly. Well, I mean, right. I have a lot more, you know, we could talk about a lot more detail, but I know you're actually going through the three states of enemy mode right now. Yeah, yeah. We, we can, we'll definitely get to the, how do we, yeah. how do we solve or get out of the, the different modes? But like, it sounds like you're just kind of saying like, you got to wake up the brain a little bit, wake up the relational circuits, become a little bit more aware. But for, the second one, stupid enemy mode, that's not <clears throat> that's not all that needs to happen. But so what is what's the difference between what you call simple enemy mode and what you all call stupid enemy mode? Well, simple enemy mode certainly be characterized as being very low energy. I'm like, I'm not here, I'm not engaged in anything. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost like my brain is asleep. But stupid enemy mode is a high energy state. Uh, actually, the cingulate cortex is getting uh, too energized and it's uh, flooding the relational circuits and sort of causing the cramp, you might say. The, or if it was a muscle, it'd be a cramp. But in this case, it's just it's pushed the top end of uh, activity. And uh, so I'm getting upset. I'm ener very energized about something and I'm likely to say or do something that I, and I look back at it and I thought, oh, that was so stupid. Uh, you know, I hope nobody took a video of that one. Uh, uh, you know, that was definitely not my best self coming through. Like, those are the moments you want to delete from your life and day uh, when you're done with them. And so uh, what basically happened is now you got a lot of energy in your system. You're upset about something. It could be as actually even you could be excited. You do something stupid, but you can also be angry or afraid or ashamed or any of the any of the emotions and um, your response is something that doesn't reflect your best self mm. uh, simply because when your brain gets that active it stops putting the messages through to your prefrontal cortex where you're supposed to uh, decide well what would be the best thing to do at this point so uh, those are the ones that people recognize very easily in themselves and others like that well, was you stupid <laughs> 
Well, you just mentioned a little bit of like how the brain processes this information, but could you go into that just a little bit more in um, j- just, you know, how those different brain, cause you go into it quite a bit uh, in the book, but just how the different brain structures, cause this also is important when we talk about the third section, which is the intelligent. Um, well, and especially the role mode. that implicit memory plays in that. I think a lot of people don't necessarily have that understanding of implicit memory and how it's, how it behaves. So I would love for you to bring that into this stupid enemy mode explanation as well. Mm-hmm. Well, it's just a slight little more complicated than uh, than that. The, the brain has essentially two very different pathways. One is the energy pathway. How much energy am I going to need for this? And so that is extremely fast and extremely low level down in the brain it's like you know down below our eyes down here it's running from the in and it says you know you hear a loud sound behind you you are suddenly cranked up on adrenaline whether you need it or not you know it just turns out you know your child dropped their book on the floor and there's no need to have a, a rush of adrenaline but the adrenaline pathway energizes you before it asks any questions mm. it is super fast and super undiscriminating Mm. so now whether you need it or not uh you've got a whole bunch of energy potentially running in there now you go through the upper pathway which um you know it'll it'll run up through this part of your brain up more through the top Um, and that one goes through your amygdala and it will uh, say okay now is this good bad or scary uh you know and it'll either add or or, um, change the energy a little bit. But uh, as it's going through that area, it starts pulling in your uh, memories of anything that's been similar to this. So what happens uh, last time? uh, Well, right today, I've got a blue shirt on. I remember one, one lady that came to talk to me had been on a cruise ship taken over by terrorists, and they all wore blue shirts. So every time she saw a blue shirt, her brain pulled in, here's someone trying to kill me. Wow. So as you might guess, uh, the first two f- few times we visited, I couldn't wear a blue shirt in the office because she'd freak out and run out the door. But that's your amygdala pulling back uh, and analyzing uh, you know, the memories of your hippocampus and saying, what, what do we have on file about this? Uh, and if it's terrifying, well, we're going to add more energy to it. Uh, mm. And that's always in the past. Anytime you've learned something, your brain remembers it and goes like, well, I'm remembering blue shirts. Uh, it doesn't really matter whether in the present a blue shirt is a threat or not. The implicit memory just says, what is my pr- previous experience? You know, um, And so uh, it loads that in extremely fast, way, uh, way before you're even conscious. And now we've got something that's being uh, activated and uh, the uh, the whole the whole cingulate cortex can't really tell whether something's from the past or the present at the moment. That's not the part of the brain that does life in the present. So it feels like it's happening again now, and that's the nature of implicit memory. So uh, anything that would have set us off um, in the past will trigger this kind of reaction again. And now if the brain is running properly, it'll move it all up to the prefrontal cortex, which will take over and say, okay, thank you for the warning. Let's see if that's still the case. But if your cingulate shuts down, uh, the brain messages don't get all the way to the front. And instead of checking it out to see if it's still the case, we get upset all over again. And it feels to us like it's happening again now. And that's why you call it this the stupid enemy mode, uh, certainly because we feel it's stupid or maybe yeah. you feel like you did something stupid, but it's because the the evaluative, the kind of advanced planning and certainly the living in the present being, uh, it's not getting to that part of your brain uh, to be more thoughtful. Uh, I, we wouldn't want to say more rational, although that's part of it, but yeah. Well, it's part of it, but it's also the, uh, the living in the present part of it uh, requires us to have successfully processed the scary experiences Mm. and the bad experiences from the past. If we didn't process them well, uh, they will load in and they'll still be in their unprocessed state. 
so they'll feel like they're they're still true now even when they're not and a lot of people actually know what those things are they call them my buttons uh you know my triggers and stuff like that and i remember one lady articulated it very well said uh don't keep saying that because you're going to make me get stupid <laughs> she, she could feel it coming on yeah like, well, you know but not knowing that you can actually process these experiences so we don't have to get stupid a lot of us carry a a list of them around like you know well don't bring that up because that you know it reminds me of my mother or my dad or yeah. you know, somebody else and and whatever well, that does my reactions come out and uh, afterwards i go like uh did we have to do that yeah and you raise an interesting point when you say that you know we don't realize we can actually process those things mm -hmm. like i mean it brings up a so when jeff and i were married we'd probably been married for maybe two years and we only had one car and he was picking me up from work every day and one day he came to pick me up. There was a miss. We were, had a miscommunication about where I was. And he ended up picking me up, what, like half an hour late or something like that. Yeah. By the time he came to pick me up, I was in a full state of panic um, mm -hmm. because I had lost my father in a car accident and I'd lost my mom suddenly. And so in my mind, he was already dead. And my immediate reaction after that was to sort of lecture him on like, you can't ever be late. You have to always be when you be where you say you're going to be. You can't ever not like you can't ever not be where you need to be, which was me trying to make him accommodate this trigger that was so deep right. for me. Um, mm -hmm. But actually through Emmanuel prayer and through Emmanuel journaling, I was able to process those old pains and those old assumptions. And it gets to a place now where like I can fall asleep while my teenage sons are still out of the house because I don't have that panic trigger anymore. Um, but that's just was it was such a revealing example to me of I don't have to make everybody else in my life bend to figure out how not to ever trigger me. I can actually process these old memories and be free of that trigger and that panic. Um, so I just that that's and if people so haven't helpful. experienced that. Yeah, if people haven't experienced that. They hear what you're saying and they're going like, yeah, well, that's easy to say, but it doesn't work. Well, it wasn't easy to do the work to process no, it. That's the point. And you have to no. sort of know how to do that also. Yeah. And we'll probably get into that conversation a little bit later too. Yes. I keep, I'm keep rabbit trailing. I'm sure. really good no, at that. No, no, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> that's well, great, before we get know. to the kind of the solutions and what can we do about these things, I do want to get to the last one. So if like simple enemy mode is more of the cold, low energy, relational circuits are off, um, kind of situation, the stupid enemy mode is the... You take that, but you add a lot of intense emotions and maybe some implicit uh, memories and triggers and, and traumas, you know, and then, you know, um, but then there's what you call uh, intelligent enemy mode. You really missed it here because I'm a, you know, I was raised a good Baptist. We could have called that strategic enemy mode. And then we had had three S's. It would have been great, oh, but you, you <laughs> second edition, you can update it at you. Um, but, but you call this more of like the cold and calculating it's, it's neither totally disconnected from people. It's, it's connected to emotions, but it's anyways, could you walk us through what you mean by strategic? And it's so sinister too, but could you walk us through this intelligent uh, enemy mode? Yeah, well, it it came out of the observation, obviously, that some of the people who are um, really hurting other people are very calculated about it. Uh, you know, sort of sociopathic. They they actually have pretty decent empathy. They know exactly what's going to hurt. They know they know exactly what's going to intimidate you. They they know exactly how much pain something is causing you, and they think good. Uh, that'll help me win. And so uh, the literature about sociopaths indicates that if you take uh, human uh, warmth attachment out of the brain, the other motivation that takes over is, is the desire to win. And that runs through the brain's cold anger system. So there's a hot anger system that makes you stupid. There's a cold anger system that makes you calculated. Uh, and then you're calculating how to make the other person lose. And that's the weird thing about the brain that it thinks if I can make you lose, I win. But very often we have a case where we cut off our nose to spite our face. You know, that we all you have to do is watch politics for a minute and you realize one side is trying to make the other side lose. 
when it actually would be to all of all our advantages if you know we won something here we did you know the we're we're getting rid of a good solution here just so we don't let them win uh and you see that in divorces i mean uh you watch people fight over stuff in divorces you go like you know what you're just trying to make the other person lose if the other person's going to win on this is the the lawyers they're going to make off with uh you know buckets of money you look at businessmen they've made huge or women they've made the, a huge fortune and then they lose you know half of it to a divorce over and over again you know these this idea of winning is causing a lot of losing i tell you what but what ends up happening in the brain is that instead of staying connected with you um, i create a, an as if person uh, right up here in for part of this part of prefrontal cortex i can create somebody uh, that's sort of like a um uh, an ideal version of what I want you to think I am. So that it's this uh, illusion that I often believe is my real self, but it's not embodied. It doesn't feel connected to to my body, to the world. It's just this is what's going to get results. And unfortunately, that's where most people put their Christianity. So they, you know, uh, you know, I remember numerous preachers saying to me well you fake it till you make it uh you uh, that's how you go about loving your enemies or caring for people and so that's what dallas will have used to call sin management like inside you've got the other reaction but you're going to manage it so that it doesn't look that way on the outside uh, and kids tend to call that hypocrisy and want to leave the church and so uh there's all kinds of defects in this way of doing business but um uh, keeping our, our manage, managing our image, uh, doing whatever it takes to win, to come out ahead. Uh, that is what cold enemy mode is. It's not really trusting you because I don't think you're on my side. And we often have a feeling, well, if you really knew me, you wouldn't like me. Hmm. Uh, but uh, I'm going to create this image as sort of an avatar kind of a way of life that most successful people seem to be indulging in including a huge number of Christian leaders. So um, mm. uh, that's, you know, one of the things we set out to, to figure out, like, why is it that so many Christian leaders end up, you know, failing in their relationships? That's that, well, they don't trust other people. They have created a nice Christian avatar that uh, makes the church look good and successful. Um, but inside, it's not doesn't match who they really think they are and yeah. uh, so that's the intelligent enemy mode and it's sort of uh, it it covers the most chilling people uh in the world like people who run death camps um and but it also might cover uh you know your deacon board so i mean it's, mm -hmm. it's this whole range of people yeah you know, that could be well, running an avatar and just to be clear, I mean, would you say that to some extent, probably all of us have been in that mode, at least for moments? Mm -hmm. I mean, that that there's like moments where we're more concerned about preserving the ideal self that we want to present to the world. I mean, isn't that kind of what makes us do things like tell little white lies or make excuses for things that we've done? Like you bring up the verbal logical explainer later on. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of that that behavior that sort of managing what I want you to think of me. I'm just well, curious. Yes, yes. It goes back to what you were saying uh, earlier about bodies. Both of you have mentioned bodies. Uh, and that is that as the signal is going through your brain, it, you know, it hits the, uh, the, the back and it's moving its way forward. It gets right up about to here. That's where your avatar part is. And it's supposed to make predictions for you. That's its job. And if you stop there with just, here's how I predict things and here's what I'll, I'll do to get the best outcome. Now you're externally focused and directed. You're trying to control the world. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you're, uh, when your cingulate's on fire and you're trying to keep other people from triggering you, you're trying to control them so you don't get upset. Now you moved a little bit farther forward. Now you're trying to control them so you get the outcome you want. So it's much more intentional, but it's still not you being present in your body mm. where I would have to be connected with you enough that however this turns out, I'm going to share your experience with you because I'm going to be present. So this 
you know, sort of calculated, uh, I say, living about an inch behind your face. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you put your face on the way you want it to be, but the real you is living uh, just an inch back there, uh, hiding and not really sharing life in the moment with other people. And so this gets kind of closer to what uh, people are looking for with mindfulness or trying to be thoughtfully present in the moment. It's also what you think of when you're trying to get into spiritual formation practices. You know, you're trying to be present in your body and share the moment with God and others. Yeah. Uh, mm. You've just stopped just short of that goal. Uh, and all of us have, you know, we can get stopped anywhere along the way. I mean, you can get stopped yeah. going, like your brain didn't wake up could stop because you got a little overheated emotionally. It can stop because you get a little too calculating. But now we want to get all the way to the front and say, I'm going to share life with others. And so the best win is something that will happen that we'll share together. And this shared life experience with God and others is actually how how you live to uh, escape enemy mode. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting because I can't even count the number of people that I have coached who have said something similar to, I just don't feel like I'm really in my life. Mm -hmm. Like I'm living my life, I'm doing my life, I'm engaging with the people in my life, but I don't feel like I'm fully connected to it. Mm -hmm. And so that feels very much like what you're saying about living an inch behind your face of just, yeah. I'm, I'm going through the motions, I'm sort of doing this ideal self out into the world thing, but there is a part of me that knows that I'm not entirely invested in this. Yes, that's uh, uh, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex is where the activity stopped instead of getting all the way to our identity in the ventral medial prefrontal okay. cortex. It's close, but no cigar. So, so does that then connect with like polyvagal theory with the dorsal state and the ventral state of the parasympathetic and we don't have to spend a lot of time there because maybe people aren't interested in that but i just wanted to ask that quickly you know because we have those states named for the ventral is the connected state and the dorsal is the sort of disconnected state of the parasympathetic yeah that's where it would overlap with that theory mm -hmm. okay yeah, yeah. It's, and then it's I'm a just a little more complex than any of these I'm explanations sure. allow, but yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I know that you know, those of us that don't have the understanding and expertise, you know, we, we're forced to simplify. <laughs> well, very often you can figure out the solution without realizing right. knowing exactly uh, where it's coming from. Every once from. in a while something is uh, counterintuitive, uh, but uh, you know, these things uh yeah, they're, they're all attempts to try to make sense of this extremely complex organ we yeah. have called the brain. So I have another question that I'm wondering if you're willing to entertain, and that is this idea of like sort of the internal critic or the voices that we have that sort of speak to us within our own heads. And there can often be voices that sound very much like enemies. Mm -hmm. um, and so what's your what's your sort of understanding of what's going on in the brain with that if you have a... An explanation. Yeah. All right. Um, so let's let's move through the the brain again. So you've got the the signal coming up here to the cingulate cortex, which is our mutual mind state. We use it for mutual mind with others. Uh, we use it to read other people's faces, and it's how I understand that there is a mind behind your face that's talking to me, and it's sort of like here's how how that what that mind is thinking. All right, so that's looking out, right? So you come up a little bit farther here to the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex. And that one is the, this as if self, but it actually is trying to figure out how are you seeing me? Hmm. So now I've figured out, I see what's going on in your mind. What are you think? All right, what are you seeing inside of me? All right, and so, uh, this is the flip side of that image. But then if we move from here, which is right up near the top, and all the way to the side to the dorsal lateral, there's a part of the brain that's usually associated with your attachment to your father. Uh, if the dorsal, if the uh, cingulate cortex is more connected to your mother, typically, uh, and it sees this is how my mother sees me is up here then how my father sees me is out here. 
and that becomes a voice that comments on you and your relationship and stuff like that. It's also the part of your brain that would function as a conscience, which is the word conscience means to think together with. Okay. So here's what other people are thinking about me and my relationships and my identity. And that voice uh, will internalize uh, any important messages uh, favorable or critical, and it will comment to you. Uh, so right out here, you know, it's saying, here's what I think about you and what you're doing right now. And, you know, this doesn't reflect well on us or however you, you know, whatever you've learned as that point of view. Um, but it's still short of, well, who am I? But it also contains uh, in those commentaries the things that have come to value. Yeah. But if they're fear-based, I value avoiding your thinking this. But it doesn't tell me who I really am. If it's attachment based, I go, I value becoming this kind of person. So, uh, you know, on the fear side, I'm afraid you're not going to like me. On the positive side is I don't think I'm being my best self right now. I think this could be improved on, you know, and so the commentary could work either direction for us. Uh, I th that's where you were going, but what, yeah. what, what, uh, what do you want to do with that information? Yeah, well, first of all, I find it fascinating that different parts of our brain sort of internalize what my mother thinks of me, what my father thinks of me. I hadn't heard that before. So that's fascinating in the first place. And then in the second place, I guess I'm I'm just sort of interpreting through my own experience about how that internal critic has changed its tone and become less fear-based and more mm -hmm. loving-based as I have practiced Emmanuel journaling which is, um, you know, for people who aren't familiar with it, it's it's receiving attunement from God, um, allowing allowing yourself to receive that God sees me, God hears me, God understands, is glad to be with me, and is for me, like doing something about it. And as I've practiced that, my voice, that internal voice changes, has changed its tone. It no longer yells at me. Um, it now, you know, has compassion and is kind to me. And so can you speak a little bit about, you know, doing something like that or sort of, I mean, that's attachment repair, right? In some way. Yeah. Is that, is that in that sort of father part of the brain or is it, yes, yeah, um, the, what's going God, on? God identifies himself as a father. Yeah. Uh, and in one sense, you could say spiritually, the point of all human attachments is to help our brain learn, uh, what attachments with a greater mind is like and what that greater mind thinks of us. Now, if you start with fear, you're only going to get critical remarks. This is what the, the greater mind won't like about me. But suppose God actually was didn't think of himself as a total failure when it comes to human beings, that he actually had an identity in mind that was a better identity for us, and he's trying to help us find that better identity then if we formed an attachment with God and he liked us, uh, you know, the interesting thing about the brain is it's always trying to discover who I really am. Mm. Uh, and starting from infancy, we don't know. And so one of the comments that Jesus made is you have to enter the kingdom of God like a small child. I think that means that you have to enter the kingdom of God not knowing who you really are and being willing to learn. And so if you're starting to learn and then God says, well, you know, uh, I don't think that was your best self there. That's not the one I had in mind. Those aren't the good works I prepared ahead of time for you to, to enjoy. So let's, let's have a redo here, right? Let's find out your real self. Uh, cause I think you can be more caring than that. I think you'd be more present than that. I think you can be more, um, in your, uh, expressive than that. I think you can be, uh, uh, more curious than that. Um, and it's, you know, it's sort of interesting that when James talks about the, the first signs of being saved, he says, you're going to be much more eager to hear, much slower to get anger, angry. Uh, and you're, you know, you're going to be engaged with other people. That's, that's a sign that you're becoming this, this new person. And what comes out of your mouth is going to start to match what's going on inside. Uh, as this new person develops. Unfortunately, we've had a uh, Christianity that's primarily like, um, we got to get rid of your old self. Yeah. Which is true enough. 
but there's no new self to replace it. Yeah. So uh, if you're not growing a new self, all you can do is try to, you know, whack a mole on the old self and something else <clears> will pop up. So this is, again, this attachment with God. Uh, but you have to figure he likes you or it won't, you, you can't hear that, you know. So how do you experience that? And that's the manual process is like learning to experience it. Even when I'm upset, God still wants to be with me. Right. In fact, I think of it sort of like this, you know. Does a cardiologist want to be with you when you're having a heart attack? And the answer is yes. That's when he knows he's most needed. And God's sort of like a cardiologist for our identities. You know, like when you're forgetting it, that's when you need me there. So that's when I want to show up. Yeah. Well, yeah. With and the, I hear the, the last little bit of time. Um, oh, do we have to be done? Well, we don't have to be done. I just, but <laughs> I just want to continue on this we'll conversation. I'm going to have the two of you maybe do most of it but the um like how to build attachment um in order to be competent and skilled at escaping uh enemy mode um throughout the book a couple of times you said teaching morality or teaching right and wrong doesn't actually help people get out of enemy mode um and for certain people it can make it worse because now they just have moral justifications for the bad behavior they can talk ethically while acting unethically uh, and so, and that's kind of that, like information will solve all of our problems. Right. But it's, it's the attachments. And so you've already kind of mentioned Sid, um, like Emmanuel prayer, uh, journaling or something like that. So I'm going to hand it over to the two of you, but if you can kind of just talk more about how do we grow and shape those attachment, uh, relationships, uh, as we kind of finish off. Well, the thing I'll start with is that you have to have your relational circuit on, mm. uh, because attachment hack has to be active at all levels you see you go if it's at the back that's not active you get simple at uh, enemy mode if it's the middle that's uh not working actually because it's too active you get stupid enemy mode if you get almost all the way to the front you get intelligent enemy mode so uh the whole thing has to be running correctly and you have to be present in your body and glad sort of glad to be here so the thing that we found activates that best is an appreciation memory. It's a thankful memory. It's something, especially if it's relationally thankful, it's like I can remember a time when God was really, you know, touching me. And if yeah. I can start with that and spend time there, my brain starts to realize, oh, uh, you know, I, I think God actually likes to be with me and I like to be with God. And that sort of time, uh, which we say is is the beginning of a of a interaction, then lets you ask God, you know, well, how do you see this, or how do you think of, of that? That's something I call the eyes of heaven. Like, okay, well, I know how I see it, and God understands how I see it. That's where we start, right? Like, I know how I see it. God understands how I see it. Am I curious about how he see, he sees it? And then. You know, some people actually get pictures. Some people hear words. Most of them are what uh, um, uh, we call no see, no hear people. The thought goes through their mind. But when you notice that thought, it makes you feel peaceful. It, it sort mm -hmm. of uh, reinterprets the picture from a different perspective. Um, and uh, suddenly things make sense that they didn't in a way they didn't before. And that that's... The, sort of those are the steps that we go into the Emmanuel process. Like, let's just get relational. Let's get present in our body. Let's ask God what he thinks about something. And then notice what comes into our mind that shifts our perspective towards um, health, towards... Um, when I say peaceful, people often think it's non-emotional. That's not the case with peaceful. Peaceful doesn't mean I'm not feeling anything. It just means it feels right. So, like... Uh, I'll give you a real short example because my wife died about two years ago. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel like I really miss her. And when that happens, I don't say to myself, what's wrong with me that I'm feeling sad and missing her? I think, wow, that's a sign that we had a decent enough relationship that two years later I still feel like, oh, it'd be nice to have her around. I'd like to have her here. And it feels right yeah to be sad and to to have that feeling so it's peaceful but it isn't because the emotions are all drained out of it it's peaceful because it just fits the kind of person i am 
Yeah, and it also makes me think too of like spiritual formation language like Ignatius talked about discerning consolation and desolation and mm -hmm. consolation is is that peaceful sense of of nearness with God no matter what the emotion or situation might be. And that sounds like what you're describing. Mm -hmm. And the Emmanuel process, you know, the the I'm just asking you like it feels like the biggest part of that is knowing you're not alone. In that you know, the enemy mode feels like it's putting me by myself, isolated over here and the rest of the world somewhere else, but I'm alone. And so that Emmanuel process is actually, I'm not alone. I'm never alone. Like God is always with me and I don't ever have to feel like I'm all by myself and isolated. Yeah. Uh, that is the, the, the first uh, and major step is that I'm not, I'm not alone. But the, the thing that the Emmanuel process happen, adds to that um, is actually what I call a rescue attachment. So the brain has what's called acquired value. And that is, you and I have never talked before. Right. Right. But I've talked with Jeff before. And when he said, this is my wife, Sid, you acquired value in my mind immediately, although I'd never met you before, as though we had had a relationship because you meant something to someone I'd already met. Okay. And so, you know, if you've got children uh, and one of them goes to college and comes home with a boyfriend or girlfriend or something like that, this stranger will suddenly acquire value to you because it matters to this person, right? Yeah. So if we're connected with God and God looks at somebody who I'm uh, upset with, and he said, yes, I can see you're upset with that, but that person has value to me. I'm actually going to accompany that person through their life. My brain immediately acquires value for that person. So God, my attachment to God becomes a rescue attachment uh, to the person that I'm having enemy mode with. Um, and so it's a way of telling our brain, uh, I can share someone else's perspective on that person when my own feels like, well, they're not on my side. Um, and God says, yes, but I'm actually on both of your sides. So uh, that is the way in which we, we work our way around yes. that. But without sharing a mind with God, uh, you know, first it tells us we're not alone and so we can be relational. Secondly, it says I, there's another perspective on people that I haven't, I'm not seeing right now from someone I value that can help me out of this. And we can yeah. actually do that with each other as well. Uh, I don't know if you and and... Jeff, do this with your kids. But every once in a while, my kids would run me into enemy mode. And so <laughs> if I was going to talk to my wife about it, she would help me out of enemy mode with the kids. She said, yes, yeah, well, we've got to see this. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I can <laughs> help her the other way around, too. You yeah. Know, so it's, it's, you know, built into the mechanism to help us get out of enemy mode. Yeah, absolutely. And I know I've experienced that in, in you know, asking those questions that you said of like, God, what do you, what do you think of this scenario? You understand how I feel and think mm -hmm. about this. What do you think? And there have, I've, I've experienced exactly that. I didn't know it was called rescue attachment, but that idea that God actually is doing something with this person that I'm feeling against. Mm -hmm. And that shifts my posture toward that person knowing that God is doing something with that person, just like he's doing something with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it lets us be a little merciful because I know I'm not being my best self all the time. So suppose instead of taking offense at you, I am actually going to help what God's about. And that is to help you find and grow your best self. Right. And, and just the times when I don't like you is exactly the times when one of us is going to have to be working on our, our better self. And I just make one other comment. When the brain is in enemy mode, it cannot tell if other people are in enemy mode or not. It simply assumes everybody else is. Mm. So if everybody around you looks like an enemy, it's your brain that's in enemy mode. Yeah. Uh, and all of a sudden we've got to go to, well, who do I trust more than my own brain? And most of us, when we're in enemy mode, will not trust other people. But if we have a connection with God, we actually have a greater mind than our own that we can trust and say, well, you know, it's not all the way you see, you know, those people could be upset. They could have a problem. They might not be on your side, but suppose we went for a higher goal than that. Let's help them become who I meant them to be. Would you like that? And in fact, almost everybody that upsets me, I think everybody that upsets me 
when they're upsetting me, I really would like it if they were a better self. <laughs> yes, very true. And would like, and I would like it if I was a better self interpreting what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's motivating. It's built right. into the system. But all of this is predicated on having an understanding of God that is kind and merciful and actually wants you to become a better self rather than a God who's constantly disappointed and angry and upset with you. Mm -hmm. So that's the first piece of it is right. Being able to understand that God is not my enemy and I am not an enemy of God. Yeah. The word understanding is little misleading in that context. And that is an ex we really need an experience of right. God being that way. It helps to start with an understanding because we can go look for the experience. But just knowing that that's true without experiencing it means we're, we don't have the actual attachment. Right. Uh, yeah. And I and think that's, that's what God means by love. He means an attachment with me so that you know me. Yeah. Uh, and you go like, well, uh, but I know him. I just know he likes me. Uh, and that's, I think, the thing about the Ignatian exercises. Uh, they're almost the opposite of the Emmanuel prayer. Emmanuel prayer is inviting God into our life. And the Ignatian exercises invite us into the life of God. And we really need to go both ways. Yeah. So that we understand God's perspective. We also know that he shares uh, uh, an understanding of our perspective. But the real liberating one is entering into God's perspective. When we're living from that perspective, all kinds of identity and possibilities exist that would never exist just from my point of view. Yes. And I love that you mentioned that because that makes me think of what you said earlier about how when we come into the kingdom, we come like children. We need to find out who we are. And the only person who can really tell us who we are is when we're invited into that life of God and God's able to tell us who we are. So I really appreciate that you said that going both ways. And mm -hmm. Jeff's going to tell us we're out of time. Aren't you? <laughs> you oh, you're muted. muted. We can't hear uh, you. We can't. So we're not out of time. Yeah, so ah, there we go. Okay. Oh. <laughs> See, I'm not. I'm not producing the the show as well as I have like sometimes. 17 more <clears throat> questions, Jeff. Well, yeah, I'm sure. Well, I was thinking while you were just talking about this, as I do have brewing in my mind um, a desire to do like a extended episodes on attachment, um, and so maybe we could have you on uh, again, Jim to kind of talk about that because you know because it's a it's a huge topic but what you just said i thought that was so interesting so thank you so much for that because i'm actually in the midst of the 19th annotation of the spiritual exercises um myself and i, and I direct the spiritual exercises i'm I, I love them so but that idea that the emmanuel prayer in one sense is receiving god's attunement to us you didn't use the attunement language but that's how it's usually thought yeah. of right so mm -hmm. it's god understanding that God's in my life. But then what you said is that the Ignatian practices is in a sense, like helping my life be attuned to God's life or right. helping my life be in God's life. I love, yeah, I just love the way you said that. So that, that could be Sid and I are going to do a whole nother podcast episode just on that idea. We're going to talk about it because that, uh, or, uh, and yep. we'll have, we'll have Send you on or something, but that's so helpful. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so I guess, I guess if you're going to make us end, I just want to say one thing, Jeff. Okay. okay. Yeah. So first of all, I just really, um, if you're going to read the book, if anybody's reading the book, which I think it's a great book, I hope people do read it. Um, I think your chapter eight is a pivotal chapter. Yes. The chapter on admitting enemy mode, because if we can't, like we can understand what enemy mode is, we can recognize enemy mode, but then admitting enemy mode feels like that is like the crux of the of the work to be done. And Even I love it's the next day. Yeah. Yeah. And I love all of your text boxes in that chapter. And you know, two of them just really leaped out at me as um I mean, I, I love the work that I do as a coach and a spiritual director, but you gave me a new category for why it's so important in that chapter um, in just sort of naming, you know, anytime I feel my individual or group identities are being distorted or misrepresented, it will be hard to admit every enemy mode. It will be easiest to admit my enemy mode to someone who encourages my best identity. And then right before that, you had said someone who has a strong and fearless attachment to me. Um, and I just... You know, I just want to just like, I just love that you said that because it makes me so grateful for the privilege and the opportunity to sort of be a strong and fearless person 
fiercely for the best identity of the people that are choosing to trust me in that kind of work. And I just really value that you encourage people to enter into coaching because of that that's there, right? That that absolute advocate for you. Um, so I just really love that you said, you know, that this is this is an important thing. It might not always be the people you're living with that can help you do this work. Um, that you're going to need to do the work with the people you're living with, but sometimes, you know, there's enough implicit memory and enough baggage built up that that maybe that maybe having someone who can really fiercely fight for and advocate for your best identity can then help you bring that into the relationships with the people that you live with. Um, Everybody that I know that's making rapid progress is being coached by somebody. So, yeah, uh, you know, that's the evidence from the field. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, that is great. I just, that felt so deeply affirming of the vocation that God has called me into. So I just felt really um, grateful for that affirmation. So thank you. You go for it, Sid. So the book for everyone who is listening and watching the book is Escaping Enemy Mode, How Our Brains Unite and Divide Us. Jim, where else can people find you, keep up with you, and get to know your, the work that you're doing at um, Life Bottle? Well, uh, you can go to escapingenemymode.com uh, and download a free 40-page study guide if you want uh, for that. Uh, that also would link you into uh, lifemodelworks.org, which is our website, uh, where it, which has all the uh, current information to the extent that a website can do that. Uh, I don't know if you've got one, but there's sort of a constant frustration trying yeah. to keep them ru running Up right. But yep. There you go. Anyway, uh, uh, then we've got a whole bunch of people like yourselves who are talking about this as well. So uh, come in, find out about the community, find people who are looking for a relational attachment-based Christianity that mm. helps us grow a, a person more like God intended. And I think you'll like the company. Amen. Well, the, um, the I'll put the links to all those things in uh, the show notes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, check the description. Otherwise, the show notes for all the podcasts. If you're a listener, if you're watching this and you are interested in coaching in the show notes, there also is a link to uh, connect with Sid, pursue that or, um, or spiritual direction, things like that. Uh, and as always, please like and subscribe to the show for everyone. Um, and there's also a way to sign up so you can get this uh, in your inbox. So thank you again, Jim. Uh, Sid, thank you for joining the show. And uh, oh, it's such a pleasure, Jim. Fun. I hope we get to do it again sometime. Yeah, you know my number. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Thanks for being available to us. Thanks, for everyone. Being, we uh, will uh, talk soon. Uh,